Thank you for joining us and welcome to Blunt Business. I'm your host, Sean Eubanks, Vice President of Business Development with Strainwise Consulting. And on our show today, we have Pamela Epstein. She is the owner and founding partner of Greenwise Consulting. In 2014, Pamela started working in the cannabis industry. She's become known as a fearless advocate for local businesses, with current clients ranging from startups and entrepreneurs to companies in all stages of development. Pamela ensures that her clients have the proper planning and business structure that result in efficiency and profitability, as well as an overall benefit to the cannabis industry. Pamela is a featured speaker at several cannabis uh, conferences, including CCIA, NCIA, State of Cannabis, New West Summit, Southwest Cannabis Conference, and Expo, uh, the, can the Capital Weekly Cannabis Conference in Sacramento, among others. Uh, she was speaking on land use, zoning, regulatory compliance, and expert on vi environmental issues as well. Pamela also serves as an adjunct professor, most recently teaching the first cannabis law course in Arizona at Arizona Summit Law School. In addition, she serves on the advisory board of the founder of Cannabis Unified St Standards, known as FOCUS. She's also currently serving as a special city attorney for the city of Hollister with regard to their medical cannabis ordinance and regulation. Pamela Epstein, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I sound so much more impressive when somebody else says it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to have you on. I've, I've heard you speak in several locations. You're such a, you're such a tremendous advocate and just a, a wonderful moderator and everything I've seen about you publicly has been tremendous. So I truly thank you for being on the show. I look forward to diving into California with you. Uh, absolutely. It's an exciting time here in California. We've got new emergency regulations. We have the March to 2018 and, and what that means uh, for the, the commercialization of cannabis here. And we're definitely taking a turn. Um, to be compliant, and, and that has both it's anxiety ridden for operators and exciting opportunities. Yeah, so let's talk about the California emergency regulations that were released on 1116 most recently. What um, What's going on in your world? Is there a floor rate? You're a consultant, you write these applications, um, you're, you're, you're involved there uh, heavily in, 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 in Los Angeles for sure. What um, what's going on in your world, and, and what's the most pressing issue that you learned from the uh, release of the emergency regs? Well, I think to, to set the stage, it can be somewhat shocking to operators uh, that we've gotten these regulations. We knew they were coming. We had a three-year march towards implementation, towards that January one date when now the uh, MAUCRSA would fully come online when the program goes green. Uh, as it were. So what we're doing right now is the same thing that we've been doing for three years, except we're a little bit, I would say, like on steroids. Um, we're trying to get all of our clients in order with their local permits or their other authorization so that they can apply for a temporary permit. So one of the most exciting things that has come out of these emergency regulations is the acknowledgement that a temporary permit is a free endeavor. It does not cost any money to apply and we should be able to start applying for temporary permits as of December 20th, uh, which is right around the corner, and the state will begin issuing those permits on January 1. Now, some of the most concerning elements with this uh, temporary permit process is twofold. One, once you opt in and once January 1 comes, you have to operate with other licenses. We're turning one faucet on and we're turning one faucet off. So in California, the leader in, in uh, cannabis since 1996 when we had the Compassionate Youth Act, uh, Prop 215, and later SB 420 with the collective model and in 2008, the Attorney General Guidelines. That made up the medical marijuana program as we knew it up and until the governor passed uh, the trio of bills that became known as MRSA, now the MAUCRSA. So once that goes on, the other faucet starts to shut down. So as you opt in and become part of this new commercialized rhetoric in California, you then have to deal with only those that have temporary permits. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a shock to the system, but what the state has done is provided us with this great transition program. And so that's really where operators 
come to me and say, well, what do I do? How do I get set up for success in 2018? And the building blocks of that are A, first, go and get your local permit, and that's investing time in where you want to be, how you want to operate, and how these localities are going to interface with you on a day-to-day life of your business, which then allows you to go and get a temporary permit. But during that time, what do you do to prepare? One is find a good distributor. If you're not going to be able to self-distribute, because the first thing that I like to talk to my clients about is what are your core, what are your core competencies? What are you good at? This idea of a collective model, which is what we were working under as a vertical integrated system, is that really what you're good at? If you're good at making a manufactured product, make a manufactured product and then use a distributor who's going to fulfill your needs both from uh, if they're a full fulfillment operator, then they can get you your source of trim or your source of oil, you infuse your product, and then they will go out and make sure that it is disseminated into the dispensaries or into the retail side of things, making sure that those retailers have in fact a license and go through the QAQC. Okay, and then so in regards to resistance of the transition. We're experiencing a lot of that. We hear a lot of that in the state as far as people not really embracing the fact that they're going from a co-op uh, nonprofit model to a management company model. Um, some people are going to abstain. They're not going to apply. And I, I think, I mean, that is California specific. I haven't had, we have not had experience in any other state with anyone resisting it. Are you finding, Pamela, that you're having to do a, a lot more advocating, a lot more convincing for people to say, listen, this is the real deal. You must comply with this. You must make this transition. It's imperative you will be shut down. Yeah, I mean, you're referring to those tough love conversations mm -hmm. that I've been having. Yeah. Um, it is. It, it's time for tough love. California has languished in a gray market uh, for a very long time, and the, the time is now for compliance. The state's Policy. We've had three years. This is not a surprise. The time to comply is now. And they're giving you avenues to get you through Q1, Q2. Because the problem is, is a lot of local jurisdictions took longer to come online than we originally anticipated. Yeah. Change is difficult. Change takes time. And we've seen it. Now we started, when I started back in 2015 in California, I maybe had three, five, ten on the best day of um, cities and counties on their agenda for the week. We had 114 issues last week that were on agendas across the state. There is a huge ground swelling there. So to get you through Q1, Q2, as these local jurisdictions come online, the transitionary period, that means go to a distributor, get into their back stock if you're a manufacturer, so that your product can come into market, it sits in their back stock from December 31st at 11.59, it can then go into market marked as um, product that was made prior to January 1 and may or may not have gone through all of the requirements um, that are now necessary to protect the public health and safety, including testing and oh. proper packaging and labeling. Okay, and then on the distribution side, Pamela, are you experiencing resistance there? Are people not embracing that? Are you finding that they're anxious about how to go and negotiate with a the distributor? They're unclear about what the role the distributor does, how they're going to collect tax, what's going to happen. Are you finding it's more of a, an uphill battle there as well? Absolutely. I think there's a lot of resistance to use a distributor in large part because that hasn't been a mechanism that's been part of the rubric of compliance here in California. Uh, with a collective model, you typically had your own sales force. You typically were delivering your own product um, to other collectives. That's not how the commercial system is set up now. A distributor is a wholly different business. And so when you think about your bottom line and your profits and losses and what's on your budget line item, you need to think, is it better for me to bring in a third-party distributor who does this every day and the cost of distribution are uh, applied across several brands 
or you know, do you want to take on that responsibility entirely yourself as an operator? Because that's an entirely different business. It's logistics. It's a sales force. It's making sure that at the state level and the local level that where you're allowed to manufacture, is that also where you're allowed to distribute? A distribution license could mean that you have to have a complete separate building. Is that in your budget? Or is it better to pay and negotiate with a distributor? And you will have a much better, easier time to negotiate with a distributor while they're taking on clients versus post-2018 when they be, may be at capacity and now you're not in as leverageable a position, especially if you're a new operator, you don't have market share. Absolutely. You're so right on that. I'm sorry, Pamela, we do need to take a quick break. Uh, we have been speaking with Pamela Epstein. When we come back, uh, she is the founding partner of Greenwise Consulting. During the break, please check out her website, www.gwcpro.com. When we come back, we're going to dive into the transitionary period of regulations and talk about new limitations on edibles in the state of California. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Blunt Business. I'm your host, Sean Eubanks, Vice President of Business Development with Strainwise Consulting. We have been talking to Pamela Epstein, who is the owner and founding partner of Greenwise Consulting. Pamela, welcome back. Thank you. So on the, on the first segment, we talked a little bit about distribution and about um, you know, the, the emerging uh, emergency regulations in the state of California. Now we're going to dive into sort of that transitionary period and, and also kind of touch on new limitations on edibles. So first thing, there's a couple of things, uh, the, the highlights, I've got several pages in front of me, the highlights are tremendous, uh, but let's talk about edibles first. What should we know and what's important right now? Uh, I think the top three things to know are one, you have to, uh, 100 milligrams in the adult use market, that's the maximum you're allowed to have, and they need to be identifiably broken down into doses of no more than 10 milligrams. This is going to be a shockwave uh, throughout the industry that likes to have 500 milligram bars, mm -hmm. 100 milligram cake pops. That's not going to be a thing moving forward. Two, you cannot be attractive to children. So these Jolly Ranchers that are sprayed on with uh, THC, that's not a, a thing that can be moving forward. We want to be very careful to not be attractive to children in how we're advertising and uh, just the, the testing and the quality assurance piece of edible. So that would be my three big takeaways. But as you said, there are pages upon pages. Yeah, and you know, I would invite people, uh, Pamela, to look at the state of, of Colorado and how we do things here and, and the development of that mature market. I can I can see, I, I know at least five people right now that are freaking out over their inability to sell their 1,000 milligram brownies. And they are pioneers in the industry. They have been here. They, they're here the right places. I, they, they, they reserve the right to make a living. And, but you're absolutely correct. They've got to make some adjustments there for sure. Yeah, I think that the time is now, right? The mm -hmm. transitionary period is, is a gift from the state. Don't overindulge in it. The time is now to go through. I know that we do this at my firm. I'm sure uh, Streamwise is able to help with this as well. We do a tech pack assessment. So we take your current packaging, your current labeling, your current SKUs uh, that you would sell, and we give you an analysis of what you can do under the new regulations. And act now, embrace it, figure out how you still fit into that marketplace. Is your product purely medical? You have a significant uh, amount of bandwidth or expansion to what you're allowed uh, to have in terms of milligrams under the medical program versus the adult use. Really, what market are you catering to, and can some of your products live in both spheres? Well, what I mean, do they need to cater for? And Pamela, what's your advice for someone who has a company and they're doing that? Do you are you going to have them? Are you going to allow them to lean on the distribution side of things and say, hey? What other products are you selling? Help me out here. I've got a thousand milligram brownie that I need to now break up in from a production side, uh, a mass production side. I mean, how do you start with that and what's your advice there? I can start with doing a true value assessment of what you're selling. I think looking at your analytics, understanding how much this is going to change your business and change your demographics, who you're targeting. Um, 
and then working backwards and making an action plan because this is the new reality. As you said, Colorado has gone through this. Don't get to the point where you're going to have to destroy your product. Figure out how you can recalibrate and readjust. Um, again, leveraging the transitionary period with a distributor. Uh, there's a few great ones out there. Old High Logistics is a great one that can help with this. They can explain distribution. Ask a distributor. Ask them to walk you through what these processes are that you're looking at, especially if you're an edible company. It really does help. Uh, but having these conversations early, bringing in your production team, bringing in your design team, don't delay on those conversations. If you ignore the reality, the reality isn't going to change. Well, and Pamela, is there a particular part of the state? I know you are an esteemed, I mean, you're, you're the special city attorney for the city of Hollister, and I, I frankly don't know how you, you must not sleep. I mean, all the things that you're doing, all the clients that you have, the firm that you're running, it's really tremendous. But is there any part of the state that you're more excited about than others? Uh, first and foremost, I think cannabis has a few years in California. It's going to be July 1st. Uh, that's when I will be celebrating New Year's. So, you know, probably sleeping for three weeks. But the most exciting parts of the state, I think every state has something to be excited about. I think in Los Angeles, we're waiting with bated breath to see how we can move forward there. I think some of these smaller cities are going to come out looking at cannabis with a forward-thinking lens because they need uh, financial stability. I think that's exciting. I'm excited to see what happens in the AI communities that have been suffering. Uh, with not being able to <laughs> make a living and see how cannabis can help them to repurpose their businesses. We now need a waymaster, uh, says CDFA. So putting some people back to work yes. in industries that maybe never thought cannabis would touch them, that's what I'm most excited about. And uh, you're referring maybe, maybe to Oakland's um, social equity program or just the attitude across the state, I totally agree with that. I mean, California leading the way in 96 with legalization and, and really fighting and paving the way for us to, to frankly have a career today. I'm just very grateful for the state of California. Let me ask you this, Pamela. Do, what do you think about the real estate gouging that's going on, the 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 multiples that are or multipliers that are put on to rent and the absolute gouging that's going on that's making it difficult for cannabis entrepreneurs to get started in what you know the city of the municipality would deem as a green zone. Yeah, I, I think the green gouging is is real and it's upsetting and it's exclusionary to even some of the legacy operators. Um, that have forged the way and the shoulders that we stand on. Um, it's an unfortunate reality. I don't see it slowing down at any pace. This is one of the, the services that I think our firm helped out with specifically. We do business development. Yep. We try to get ahead of a city, you know, hedge your bets. We know we have good uh, metrics that we can use to say, well, this city may be coming online. Uh, what then do we want to look for in property? If the state sets a 600-foot boundary from schools, daycare centers, places where children recreate, parks, I always err on the side of caution. If I can get 1,250 feet away, which is the school zone drug-free act at the federal level, yes. never. You want to look at whether or not a property has energy, whether it has parking, whether it has good access from a security point of view. This is all real estate due diligence. Just because it's in a green zone doesn't mean it's the ideal location. And that's how you can really leverage a more meaningful discussion with a landowner is what is your property really worth? Just because it's zoned correctly doesn't mean that it's ideal and doesn't mean that you couldn't get stuck in planning and building. Yeah, there are two things I see, Pamela, and you might agree with me on this, is when you're talking to a potential client about using your services, they're overlooking the expertise and the bandwidth that it takes to find a property that's qualified and to negotiate that. I'm also finding, Pamela, that uh, it's difficult to convince a client that, yes, you are, you know, yes, we've, we've honored the setbacks and the sensitive use, and there are a couple of dispensaries around you, cannabis businesses that are not licensed, but they're going to be going away in the future. And that is a, a muddied water between the landlord who still continues to rent to an illegal cannabis business, frankly, and then your new client who's moving in next door in the area 
and them understanding that, look, we're doing everything right. We're keeping you in compliance. That's what our firm does. And, and sort of balancing that sort of um, what can feel like babysitting at, at, in one respect and also feel like you're, you're having a hard time creating value with the customer to let them understand that, look, this is a time-consuming process and there's a lot that goes into it. Absolutely. I think that you want to look at LA and, and measure M and the ordinance that has been coming out of there. They're going to assess a $20,000 a day fine, potentially, to a landowner who is leasing or allowing, acknowledging um, a non-compliant operator to maintain operations. They're yeah. saying that they have the right to shut off their power and water to the whole building. So if this is one suite or one area, be advised. Um, the local jurisdictions are starting to take notice of this. They want good operators. They want good operators to invest in their city. They won't do that if they don't get enforcement. And the more that we regulate, the more the enforcement dollars will be there to support those that are, you know, engaging in these conversations. But let's all remember, contracting and lawyers are essential in the acquisition of property. Please note that we are, and this is like a Wednesday, is it Wednesday? We'll do like a free tip legal advice. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> cannabis is still a Schedule 1 drug. Yeah. There is a covenant that runs in every standard lease that says if you conduct a federally illegal activity, you can be evicted. Why is this important? Because we're federally illegal activity. Yeah. That provision needs to be redrafted. It's an important provision to be there. If I owned a building, I wouldn't want somebody doing illegal activity there, right? Yeah. It makes sense. Absolutely. Um, you need to have it redrafted. Otherwise, what happens to a client of mine in Arizona will happen. Somebody else will come in, buy the building, and evict you and have a very easy pathway to licensure. Absolutely. No, that is that is such great advice, and I hope people heard that, and I hope it resonated with them. You know, you also see, Pamela, where they're going to, uh, people get in trouble with CAMS and not having the appropriate language with a cannabis-specific attorney putting that in the in your lease contract uh, that's, that says, look, uh, for common area maintenance, right, everyone shares a certain amount of expenses that, that have to do with maintenance. On the cultivation side of things, when, you know, you might have a, several tenants around you in an industrial park, and they are used to paying, you know, six bucks a square foot, and now you go in with your energy usage and you have a difference, and now they're paying nine, 10, or, or sometimes 20 or more. Uh, but having that language that protects you in the contract that says, look, we're gonna pay the difference in the cams. We understand we're cultivators and we're gonna have an increase in energy usage, but you don't get to evict us, and most importantly, the tenants around us don't get to sue us uh, for that increase in cost. Absolutely, John, you nailed it. Um, these are all big concerns. Look, mm -hmm. when you are doing a lease or even a purchase option that's contingent upon getting a permit, also an important thing to do, don't buy a building if you are in a competitive process that you may or may not win. Right. Um, you need to make sure that the landowner is willing to sign a notarized piece of paper that says, I acknowledge that this is a cannabis use. It's yeah. different for somebody to acknowledge it, say, sure, use it, I'm gonna charge you higher rent, it's different to tell them they have to put their name on a piece of paper that's going to be notarized. Don't forget to have these conversations. Don't get in the point where you have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and have an application pending due the next day. And you go and take that, you take the landowner this form and they say no. Absolutely. And then you're out. You can't proceed. Yep. No question invest about it. Invest in a due diligence. Uh, invest in a good consultant. Invest in a good attorney. Well, also, I, I think it's wonderful advice, and Pamela, I would add to that also, you know, a cannabis-specific real estate company, uh, you're surprised, I'm definitely shocked, uh, how some of our clients, because we will charge, and you would charge, rightly so, to find these properties and vet that process, but uh, we have some strong uh, real estate teams in, in Los Angeles and other areas, but we have, uh, you know, other parts of the state where we're challenged. Um, but we're, you know, I think it's okay to ask that real estate agent, what cannabis experience do you have? How many real estate cannabis specific deals have you done? Talk to me about cultivation, processing, and retail. Make sure they know because you can spin your wheels with the wrong real estate agent that doesn't have anything to do. They're trying to get into cannabis. We totally honor that. Fantastic. Welcome to the industry. But what's the most efficient thing is to use a cannabis-specific real estate agent uh, and attorney team. Absolutely. I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, 
nail on the head. It's building a team. This is a not one person can do everything. Unless somebody has a firm that has like 50 to 100 people, mm-hmm. you, this is not a, a soup to nuts service. If somebody tells you that, and Sean, I'm sure you would agree, you run far and fast. Because there is so much movement in this industry, especially right now in California. It changes nearly by the day, sometimes multiple times mm-hmm. a day, depending on what agency releases what new information, that if you're relying on one person, it's not possible. I mean, I have colleagues that I call 5, 10, 15 times a day where we work through these issues so that we can properly advise our client. We're a cannabis community, and if we don't treat these issues in a community spirit, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And, you know, cannabis is a green rush. Everybody wants to come in. You have to ask the tough questions, and it's okay. And if somebody tells you, I don't know, but I'll get you the answer, that is a better benchmark of who to use than somebody just off the cuff giving you information to give you information. Absolutely. Well said. And, you know, with all the municipalities in California and, and all the conversations about cannabis that are happening throughout the state, um, absolutely. That is a great, great tip is that, you know, to, to just pay attention that people knew, do need to research for you. They need to understand it and they'll get back to you with the proper answer. Uh, we do need to take a quick break, guys. Uh, when we come back, we'll be rejoined by Pamela Epstein, who is the owner and founding partner of Greenwise Consulting. Check out our website on the break, gwcpro.com. Welcome back to Blunt Business. I'm your host, Sean Eubanks, Vice President of Business Development with Strainwise Consulting. On our show today, we have been speaking to Pamela Epstein, who is the founder and uh, owner of Greenwise Consulting. Pamela, welcome back. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, you have been tremendous. I think you've given away thousands and thousands of dollars of free advice on this podcast today. I so appreciate that. Continuing with our last segment here, um, what in your opinion, Pamela, is the most difficult license to get in the state of California? Uh, I think initially it's going to be retail. It's the most controversial. It's the one that's public facing. Uh, storefront retail specifically mm-hmm. uh, is the most challenging. It's the one where you've got the concerned parents, the concerned citizens. They come up in outrage. Um, so that's going to be the one that's going to cost you the most capital in terms of expending dollars to educate. Okay, and are you as excited as I am about the delivery service and the development of that part of the industry and the way that it gets people in a little bit less expensive? You still have to have a location, uh, but it's monitored differently, similar to a dispensary license, um, but not retail facing. Um, Are you as excited about delivery as everyone else seems to be? I think that delivery has an absolute place in our society, with not just within cannabis, but in general. We like our medications. We like our products delivered. There is a reason that Amazon is the largest retailer, yeah. uh, I think, in the world to date. Um, I think it's not, it doesn't replace retail, and I think that's an important conversation to have with cities. Um, there's still that need to be able to have an interaction and, and that safety issue with people coming into your home. So I'm excited by it if it's done well, and I'm hoping that our industry can do that. Uh, you know, one bad actor, one bad apple can ruin it for the whole. So I'm hoping that our industry takes a very heavy-handed approach in security and safety. Okay, and, and California is unique in the way that they have a micro business to find. We're, we're excited about that. We're advancing our own interest in the state of California as well as some of our clients. Um, talk to me, Pamela, about micro business. Uh, what do you see as limitations for that, or is it just all good news and exciting? Um, I think it's good news and exciting. I always think that you got to look double in the details, and the micro business, all needs to take place on one premise. Uh, so it's not go out and get three and vertical stack. You got to be on one premise. You got to find zoning that works for that. That's education at the local level to make sure that they understand that. The micro business to me is really something that shines for San Jose, Palm Springs, San Francisco, those cities uh, that allow for the collective model to be licensed and mandated vertical integration at the beginning. That's a great license for them. It's also important to note that that license type limits you to 10,000 square feet and to non-volatile manufacturing. And you have to do at least three out of the four allowances, so distribution, manufacturing, retail, and cultivation, in order to um, 
be applicable for that license type. So with those caveats in mind, it's important for us to, to embrace that. I think it will work fabulously for some. Uh, I'm personally most excited about the shared facilities for manufacturers. Mm-hmm. That shows me that DPH really listened and really looked at the way um, manufacturing and especially food uh, manufacturers operate. It's the Wonder Bread model, the Venmo model. Before you are large enough to run your own kitchen 24 hours a day, it's better to have a shared facility. It's also how we're going to get safe, tested, high-quality products to the market more quickly and offset the cost. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm real excited to, to get the ring. Yeah, they seem to they seem to have hit that one uh, hit the nail on the head with that. It, it it is exciting. So there's there's four license types for uh, uh, for the manufacturers. Um, you've got extraction using volatile sol- solvents. You've got extraction using non volatile solvents, uh, which is interesting uh, that they've de- they've deemed ethanol as as, as non volatile. Um, but you've got infusions as well, and you got pack- packaging and labeling only. Mm-hmm. So of those, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, Sean, you take it away. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so of those, I mean, I, I, I find that those are well-defined. I think that's impressive. I, I agree with you on the, the Wonderbed model. I, I think there's tremendous um, traction there, and I think they've got well-defined, well-spelled out, um, you know, a, a, a path of success for manufacturers. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how that evolves. I'm happy to see that some of these smaller brands are going to be able to survive the cost of compliance by giving them this opportunity to come together and share resources, share expenses. Um, I think that's going to ensure the diversity of the market and the inventory for the consumers, both at the medical and the adult use side of things. Um, I was really happy to see that. We saw a, a lessening of the restrictions with no dairy, with no caffeine, and now, you know, can of butter still allowed uh, mechanism there. So DPS, DPA, I think, is the one that really took the most of those initial comments to heart and came back uh, with a roadmap that was far exceeding what was asked of them. We're still in a holding pattern. There's reserve sections for their facilities. We don't have them yet. But that'll be something that we can really start to integrate and educate the localities for. Well, so and- we've got that window of opportunity. And, and what do you see that uh, the consumers and operators can expect? I mean, this is interesting because you've had such a long, mature medicinal market, right? In, in Colorado, we had a shorter time frame. You got a three-year a three year window where you could see sort of, you know, the, the recreational market, adult use market catch up to medicinal. But you've got such a mature, unique situation in California. Do you expect the recreational side to take off as fast and the production from Arcview, uh, the, the, um, uh, the um, uh, what am I trying to say, presentation, or the, uh, um, uh, what they're presenting or promoting or, or trying to, um, uh, what's the word? Um, it is um, uh, predictions, sorry, predictions that they're trying to make uh, for the market. Do you think it's going to grow that fast to recreational or do you think there's going to be stumbling blocks along the way? Um, I think we're going to look at the local level and who's prepared. I think we have about a dozen cities and more counting every day that are investing in the adult use. I like the transitionary period allows for you to deal with licensees irrespective of MRA until July 1, so I think that's going to provide more allowance, but it's going to be up to the local jurisdictions. I'm really excited by the city of West Hollywood, who wants to be the new Amsterdam of California, issuing 32 new licenses in the city that is prospectively the size of a postage stamp compared to everybody else. But they're taking the leading standards. They're giving people the option to on-site consume, uh, drill down into edibles and uh, vaping. I think that's a really unique approach. They are, to circle us all the way back to the Green Rush, looking at an application prior to having real estate so that they can invest in the right person for their city to make sure that it's boutique, that it fits in line with what is quintessentially West Hollywood, with just not allowing people with big money to grab an asset and not to get the license. So um, I think that all plays into other adult use. I think you're really going to see 
uh, the marketplace come out with nutraceuticals. 80% of all household decisions are made by women. That's a huge market. Yeah. Um, nutraceuticals, you're going to see very pharmaceutical-driven medications. People still really need that without the sugars, without the, you know, the natural anti-inflammatory. Sugar is a natural inflammatory agent, so there will be medical. And then there's going to be, like, beer and beverage, high-end wine, high-end connoisseur cannabis, and then cannabis for the everyday consumer. So... I really hope to see this market be that diverse, be able to, to take on adult use, but we need to do it in a real pragmatic, uh, well thought out way. I know that you can speak, Sean, specifically to Colorado and the challenges that happen with the recreational market. Well, absolutely, and and you know the development of it is, and we use this model and, and how that works to kind of try to predict what's going on with the state. But you know, we we everyone's so excited about California. It's almost like we treat it like a, a, a different country, uh, and we're I mean everybody's rooting for it. Let me ask you something controversial, Pamela. And if you're uncomfortable answering this question, that's okay. Um, I know you're excited about some parts of the state, but specifically in regards to Oakland, right? There's not a, another city in the state that probably needs. Uh, a cash infusion, uh, help with funding and, and, and the programs that are there and the situation. You've got an NFL team leaving there. There's a lot of um, the, a pull out and, and, and flight from the city. Do you think that the way they're going about their intention, their heart is in the right place with trying to have the social equity program, but do you find that the government's going to be in the way of real investment and real capital and real cannabis entrepreneurs moving into Oakland versus other municipalities that are just easier to get into? Uh, I think that that is the case regardless of a social equity program. It's, you know, the smaller jurisdictions are making it easier because they need money. Um, I appreciate Oakland and the Los Angeles attempt at doing social equity. Unfortunately, sometimes social equity turns into a little bit of extortion. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think an incubator program oftentimes works better. Look, I am a big proponent of regulation. Over-regulation is difficult. Uh, a city or a county shouldn't be able to reach across and tell an operator, tell a landowner, look, you have to rent to this person who may not be able to pay their bills. Absolutely. And, you know, you wonder, are you setting that person up for failure, right? I mean, the, the, the idea is perfect, but the implementation and the business experience of, do we take someone who's a convicted felon who's just fresh out of prison and make them a CEO? Is, does that work for them? Or is there a better way to, to infuse them into the business? And, and most importantly, start that transition, that rehab period. Uh, it, it's an interesting quagmire that the city has and the state and the industry in general were trying to rectify the past uh, injustices that have happened uh, and the specific demographics that have been harmed for that, namely African American males and, and also the understanding that look we want to create viable businesses and the most important thing is not creating a job but creating a business um, that's, that's, that will stay. And so I, I just recognize it, it's, it's quite a mess um, I do think that what, is, what has gone really, really well in the state of Colorado is an absolute capitalist model. And I know that word sometimes in California is a dirty word, but just letting people get into business, lower the restrictions, lower the tax rates, lower, lower what uh, the barriers to entry, and let people fight it out in business, and that always results in what's happening for the customer. And you can see that in Colorado. Yeah, there's $70 ounces. I get it. I mean, there's price competition and some of the cultivators are being squeezed. However, this open capitalist model benefits the consumer. And that's really what should be happening in the industry, in my opinion. I agree with you. Look, I think it goes back to the adage of give a man a fish, he eats for one day, teach a man to fish, and he can feed himself and his family and his village. Um, Giving somebody a, a license simply because they may have been harmed or a group of people may have been harmed, that doesn't mean that they have the tools in place to make that business survive. Um, if you allow businesses to come in that can afford it, they can hire people. Um, they can teach them. See one, do one, teach one. We have to embrace that and we have to also look at social equity at a much larger scale. People that lost jobs, that were homeless, that may not have the right color skin, they're still social equity. Um, and so we really have to take that word and elaborate what it means. Um, because the conversation, 
And not that I don't think that we need to address the war on drugs, we absolutely do. But there were other injustices happening along the way that prevent people from getting access to business. And we're not being equitable if we don't utilize that across the board. Absolutely. Uh, so you offer so many services and you're helping people in, in the state of California. Um, what, it, what does it take to get started with you, Pamela, and, and, and how should someone get started? Also, the two-part question on that, you mentioned that retail might have the most challenges, the most ambiguity, the gray area. Uh, what is the easiest entry point, in your opinion, to get into this industry in California? Which license? Well, easiest? Um depends on the jurisdiction. I'm going to give you the legal answer. It always depends. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends on the vertical. It depends on what you want to do. I think that you should look at what the easiest uh, avenue is, but what is your passion? What are you going to be excited about every day? What is even at the end of a bad day is still going to excite you and motivate you to the next day? That's the most important, and then let's figure out how to do that. I think there's so many exciting opportunities in the ancillary spaces that people are overlooking. And so getting into Canvas doesn't mean you necessarily have to touch the plant. There's problems with CRM software. There's you know track and trace opportunities. Invest in what you know how to do and what you're passionate about, and you can find that avenue, I think, in Canvas such an evolving uh, opportunity. Well said. I would invite our listeners also in, in the state of California, you got a license potential for a cannabis event organizer license, which is awesome, right? I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can do that yeah. you're not touching the plant. Absolutely. And, and how you get to Greenlight uh, is great. You've been giving them our good old uh, email or our website, www.gwdpro.com. Uh, the best Absolutely, and I think it's worth noting you have a 98% success rate with over 75 applications submitted across California. Is there a, for someone listening to think I might want to get in this business, is there a starting point, price range, or an average spend that people can expect with you to apply for a license? Um, exclusive of, of real estate, I would say you know, you're going to want to have some liquid capital in the neighborhood of no less than $350,000, and that's not including your real estate, um, more like half a million or more. Um, it's the, the less capitalization you have up front, the more difficult and a tight squeeze it's going to be, and that really depends on the license type also. Um, you you kind of have to invest in, in a real budgetary discussion. Uh, with your consultant uh, about what the true costs are going to be. And, and I like to do a three-year projection. Sean, I'm sure you would agree. You know what you're going to be expecting. Um, and, and put some real-world glasses on. I, I think this is the, an important point to drive home. The Green Rush is, yes, the Green Rush. The cost of compliance is exceptionally high. Uh, and the valuations that we see thrown around, for a business that's not operational yet, a $7 million valuation is hard for me to, to wrap my head around. So be careful. Don't be blindsided by the fact that it's a green rush. It's still a business, um, a controversial business at that. Absolutely. Be realistic. Be conservative. Mm. Well said, and as far as evaluations go, if you're having someone that's not a professional and hasn't done that before, um, be careful of that. I think there's so much to touch on uh, for sure. Well, Pamela, it, is, it has been a pleasure having you on. You're such a distinguished guest. It's, it's, I see you all over the country speaking, and, and, and you're just uh, you're a tremendous advocate. You do so much work. Um, obviously, a huge compliment, all the boards that you sit on. Um, you know that you're the service that you're doing a city attorney there for Hollister tremendous it has just been uh, a great time having you on the show and I wish you nothing but success in the future wonderful and I want to thank you all for joining us on this edition of Blunt Business you can download episodes of our program by going to CannabisRadio.com 
bluntbusinessradio.com or subscribing to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, and now iHeartRadio. Have an outstanding rest of the week, and we'll see you guys next week.